Assistant Director General of CESRIC, OIC. Welcome. We have Marcia Smilovic. Uh, she's an activist and founder of LEGIS, uh, an NGO in um, Macedonia. Uh, and we have uh, Jonathan Fowler, UN Regi Regional Communicator, uh, Communications Officer. Welcome you all. And uh, I would like to start with Jonathan. And, um, and since you are also um, working for the UN, and of course United Nations is, is also uh, uh, taking action how, uh, to combat hate speech globally. And maybe you can uh, here uh, explain us what the United Nations is doing in this regard. Thank you, the floor is yours. Absolutely, thank you. Um, am I on? Yes. So I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers. Um, again, the, the government of Turkey. Uh, this has been a very, very stimulating uh, couple of days. Uh, I was invited to attend last year, but unfortunately was unable to make it. So it's, it's great to actually be here this time. Um, I also, because I wanted to single out the, the government of Turkey, I'd also like to underline that uh, part of the United Nations work, and I'll go into more detail in, on this in a moment, but part of the United Nations work on hate speech is of course curated by the Alliance of Civilizations. Now the Alliance of Civilizations was an idea, an initiative by our former late Secretary General Kofi Annan, but it was co-sponsored by the governments of Spain and Turkey. So it, it's important to underline that because this was created in 2005 precisely to explore the roots of polarization um, and how hate speech was actually accentuating that, that polarization um, and to attempt to spur international, um, intercultural, interfaith dialogue through education, through youth work, through work on migration and work on the media. I'm not going to talk in detail um, about the, um, the work of the Alliance of Civilizations, but I did want to mention that because it underscores the fact that um, governments who are concerned about this issue are very deeply involved and have been deeply involved in the UN's work on this for, for, for, for some time. Um, and that also we have multiple strands to our work. Specifically, what I, I, I want to talk about um, today is the, the No to Hate campaign. Because we're here talking about strategic communications, um, I thought it would be useful to, to address a campaign, what the strategy is behind that campaign. Um, and please wave if I'm starting to run out of time. So, um, fine, I'm not quite sure how the clicker works here, but um, can somebody help me with the moving on? Okay, here we go. Right, I want to begin with a childhood anecdote. When I was a schoolboy, and I lived in North Wales uh, when I was young, up to the age of eight years old, um, whenever we would get into arguments in the playground and we'd talk to our parents about them or we'd talk to the teachers afterwards, there was this common proverb which was, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. So the sense was, as long as nobody's actually hitting you, physically attacking you, really you're not hurt. But we do know, of course, um, that hate speech causes real harm. So words ha actually have the possibility of morphing into real world damage. As we put it in our campaign, words can be weapons. Um, we have a number of infographics, graphic, uh, graphic identity for the campaign. Um, this is one of my favorites, I have to say. It's quite brutal, but it's quite powerful also, because the implication being that spoken word, written word, these can, things can actually become we weapons which can morph into real world damage to people. Now, as our Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, put it in 2019, hatred is a danger to everyone, and so fighting it must be a job for everyone. And this was why there was a decision made at the, at the top level of the United Nations to create an actual strategy for combating hate speech, a specific one that would inform the work of all the different parts of the United Nations, be that in peacekeeping, be that in health, be that in other areas, to basically ensure that we were all on the same page and that we could help to empower member states also to, to, to combat this, this ill. Now, in 2021, so uh, the context of course is no accident, um, the UN General Assembly pr pr proclaimed 18th of June as the International Day for Countering Hate Speech. So we had the first edition of it this, this June 18th. Um, now you're all aware of course that hate speech, misinformation and disinformation go hand in hand. So one of the reasons why uh, this International Day was created was because hate speech, misinformation related to the pandemic, everything was accelerating with finger pointing about who was supposedly to blame for the pandemic, 
um, misinformation, disinformation about vaccines, attribution for COVID. These things were all coming together at the same time. On the back, of course, um, of the kind of hate speech that we've been seeing over recent years related to, to, to the, what's known as the migration crisis. Um, so these were, th th this, this was not a coincidence, basically. This was an intent to try and drive things forward. The strategy has, now this is, I forgot my glasses, I'm afraid, so I may need to turn around at this point, but basically we've got four driving elements to it. The understanding that uh, just being aware that hate speech is being purveyed is, is, is, is not enough. You have to understand that hate speech causes real harm. Um, we have to navigate very carefully the issues of censorship because anybody who's familiar with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights knows that um, Article 19 of that is very strict on protecting freedom of expression. This is also etched into other bits of international law, including the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights. At the same time, uh, international law doesn't mean that there's a free-for-all to say what you like. There are limits uh, placed um, when we start to move into the areas of incitement to violence, um, discrimination, and so on. So, no censorship, yes, but making sure that um, while protecting free speech, anything which crosses the boundaries um, has to be tackled in the right way. Education is absolutely critical to our strategy because if you don't educate people um, to actually build resilience, uh, um, then you are actually helping to empower a hate speech. So basically, the route to prevention is education. Um, and collective action, as I cited the Secretary General before, it's everybody's responsibility to deal with this, either to call out people who are doing it or to stop it from happening, um, or just to not do it yourselves through you know, lack, of, lack of awareness of what's being said. Again, rather small, but basically, we seek to max maximize reach, we seek to build trust by elevating the voice of the Secretary General, who believes very strongly in the essence of this campaign. Um, we seek to spread knowledge about the negative impact of um, hate speech. Now, of course, we all know that hate speech is not something that's been created in the online world, but examples we can cite, I mean, the, the use of the mass media by the Nazis to other the Jews in Germany was the way that they paved the way to the Holocaust. Um, in the Rwandan genocide in the 1990s, Radio Milkolin was the key vector to other the, uh, the uh, Tutsi population and therefore paved the way for the Rwanda genocide. And in the internet age, we've seen this worsening in a way in terms of the reach of hate speech. Um, so that the, uh, we've got examples, for example, from uh, Myanmar with the, the, the, the, um, the attacks and the atrocities against the Rohingya population which have been um, amplified um, and then given real life, real world life by, um, through, through platforms. Um, notably huge challenge there because of lack of moderation on some platforms. In other words, platforms were not able to track or were not seeking to track the kind of um, negative language uh, that was then leading to real world violence. And we've also seen this in, in many, many other settings. Um, and this is, this is always a cause for concern. So. Um, we can demonstrate the real negative impacts, share good practice on countering it, um, how to push back, um, how to get people who are pushing hate speech to actually get out of that zone, kind of you know, moving them away from, from, from being so negative, and engaging the public um, to spur interest. Why is this a problem? What does this mean in the real world? You know, words can actually lead to circumstances which can end up with people being uh, suffering from violence and actually being killed. So, we engage specifically, um, we have primary targets uh, for this campaign, so we in, engage with digital natives, the kind of people, this is very specifically related to online hate speech, of course. People who are using multiple devices and platforms um, and for whom the internet online is a natural component of their self-expression. So this is the risk where um, negative thoughts that people have, negative attitudes can actually then spill into, uh, on, online and end up being amplified. Secondary targets are the, um, the world, what we call the world shapers, so the media, tech business executive, journalists, public officials, the kind of people that we need to have on side to set the right policy tone. And then a, sec and a further secondary target, um, people who are dealing with youth, youth caretakers as we refer, refer to them, that would be educators, but also you know, families, um, these kind of groups. Um, the main... Uh, planks, as it were, of our campaign are clarity, make sure that the, uh, the content is clear, 
that it's relatable, that it's inclusive, so that when we're doing this, we're not doing this kind of us, us versus them adversarial stuff, but that we're making sure we're all on the same page. And also very hopeful. And um, that's not about being sort of naive and sort of everything's beautiful in the world. You know, while addressing the real issues, we're actually talking about solutions. We can purvey um, sort of solutions-focused uh, ways to deal with hate speech and also show the advantages um, of togetherness. We launched the campaign in May 2022 um, with different kind of visuals, and um, you can see some of them up here. And we also created a portal that uh, anybody who's interested in the United Nations work uh, on this area can go to so that they don't have to kind of go to individual bits of the United Nations because we do recognize that we are a kind of complex animal, the United Nations. We have different parts. It's sometimes a little bit hard to find out what's going on in one area or another. And um, so we brought all this together in a single portal with a very clear written strategy um, so that people are able to get the assets that they need um, but also so that they can, um, they can find out where, if they have a kind of niche interest in a particular part of the work of the United Nations, they can find out what that sort of niche entity is doing um, on the hate speech issue and, and, and help to amplify that work. We created the portal, as I uh, said here, we've had, um, we've had a decent number of page views, uh, we've created the assets in nine languages, um, and we've implemented the campaign in over 40 countries so far. The key thing, of course, because we are the global family, um, is to localize the content. So as I said, we've implemented it uh, specifically the campaign in over 40 countries. We have some splendid examples of cross-border collaboration, by the way. The colleagues that I have um, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, in Montenegro and Serbia, created a kind of common set of messaging um, because of the, co the commonality of language in those three countries, um, tailored to the particular circumstances of each country. But there was an intent there because a lot of the hate speech is cross-border in that region. Um, and so there was an intent to, to actually um, come up with uh, sort of cross-border messaging that would affirm the fact that people need to work together across their borders and silos. Um, and we, we have the content now available in 25 languages. So that's um, there's just some examples there on the screen. Uh, phase two we're moving into now, um, and this is I'll wrap up with this. Um, we're basically moving forward to the next international day, so that will be on June the 18th next year. Um, and we're going to try to um, increase understanding of the real harm that's caused, because that, that's an area that we, need, we feel we need to push more on. What do we have in terms of direct examples? We need to be much more specific on this. Um, we're going to do a deeper dive into the impacts on vulnerable groups because it's, it's well known that the primary victims um, of uh, hate speech tend to be the people who are already the most vulnerable, who are less likely to be able to push back, um, and that that's hugely problematic because they need to be supported as well as empowered to deal with this. So we're going to look more at the uh, you know, dive deep into the, into the, the issues of uh, effects on vulnerable groups. And we're going to try to move more from awareness raising into direct engagement. And this is where anybody in this room who's interested in this work or is doing work on this th themselves, of course, um, do please reach out to us because it's important that we all engage together on this. I mean, one of the things about the United Nations is we are the collective, we are a grouping of the member states, uh, the international community in the best sense of the word. Um, and so anybody who's doing anything on this can use these assets, tailor these campaign assets and use them for themselves. Um, or indeed uh, feedback to us what they're actually doing on the ground because it's very, very much not top down, this kind of campaign. Um, and finally, um, just a couple of points, um, sort of internal stuff. We're drawing on some very specific expertise in different parts of the United Nations system. And I do want to point out, as well as the Alliance of on the Civilizations, the Office of the Special Advisor for the Prevention of Genocide. Um, extremely important work's being done there, and they have really informed this campaign, and they do a lot of risk monitoring um, in different parts of the world to see where there's a risk of hate speech actually moving into something much more serious. Um, and so we're working very closely with them at the Department of Global Communications level. And that's a wrap. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you very much. Um,
as you mentioned, uh, I mean, the online hate speech is also quite important. It can lead to also uh, real crimes, in some cases also terror attacks. Uh, also genocide is also uh, the speech is and um, the demonization of certain ethnic groups is, is playing a huge role uh, for the genocide. Also, we have seen this in the past, uh, the genocide in Srebrenica and in, in other parts of the world. And um, uh, the United Nations has declared uh, the 15th of March last year as the day uh, to combat Islamophobia. Uh, this is the day that uh, Tarant has carried out uh, uh, the terror attacks in, in, in, in Christchurch, which has killed 51 people and uh, many more injured. And of course, um, the OIC, Organization of Islamic uh, Cooperation, uh, is also playing a role in this field uh, to combat hate speech and extremism. Muslim Isla Islamic world is also at the receiving end of this hate. Uh, we see this in the rise of Islamophobia. And, um, and also in the Muslim world, there are also certain groups who are misusing Islam uh, at the same time. So it is an also important subject. And we have today a representative uh, with us, and he will be speaking about the OIC's uh, um, vision in this field. And Fadi Farazin is to today with us, and, uh, and um, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Anas. Uh, at the outset, uh, please allow me uh, to express our appreciation and deep thanks to the Directorate of Communication of the Republic of Turkey for their kind invitation and for the excellent arrangements and the outstanding hospitality. Uh, here, uh, as you said, uh, Mr. Anas, I will be focusing um, on the OIC, which is the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which is the second largest intergovernmental organization after the United Nations. We have a membership of 57 countries. And I am personally from a center which is part of the OIC, which is called the uh, CESREC. Now, if we look at the OIC and the charter of the OIC, see the, it has the lofty goals of establishing peace, security, uh, respect for diversity, uh, dialogue and uh, tolerance. But when it comes to reality, we see that the OIC faces a lot of challenges that prevents it from uh, achieving those lofty goals. Here I will focus on two challenges. One is violent extremism, and the other one which is hate, uh, hate against Muslims. Now, different terminologies can be used, but in the OIC, and this can be argued, but in the OIC, we use the uh, terminology of Islamophobia in our documents and in our uh, resolution. So I'll stick to that. The analysis that we did at our center, it shows that in 2003, there is an inflection point. Now, we're starting to see a trend where the uh, overwhelming majority of violent extremist incidents are happening in OIC countries, and to be specific, almost 76% of terrorism incidents and 90% of all fatalities happen in OIC countries. So this uh, reality, coupled with the devastating effects of uh, violent extremism on humans, on societies and economies, have pushed this issue to the top of the agenda of the OIC as well as the international community. As a matter of fact, the OIC has been among the first uh, to recognize this issue and formulate a policy for it. The OIC issued in 1999 a convention and a code of conduct on combating international terrorism and has not relented in its efforts uh, since. The 13 Islamic summit that happened here in Istanbul in 2016 the kings and the heads of states of the OIC member countries spent a significant part of the agenda of that summit to tackle this issue. If we look at the OIC and the highest level strategic document there, which is called the OIC 2025 Program of Action, we see that it identifies uh, radicalism, violent extremism, and Islamophobia as areas of high priority. Uh, we at CESREC, as a subsidiary organ of the OIC, we have also been very quick to uh, react. 
uh, following the uh, uh, meeting of the OI institutions on combating radicalism and violent extremism that happened in the headquarters of the OIC in Jeddah 2015, we sprang to action and we formed a cross-functional team to focus on this issue. A lot of outputs have been achieved, but uh, some of them uh, I would like to highlight, such as our report, which is titled Towards Understanding Radicalism and Violent Extremism in the OIC, another report which is Achieving Peace and Security in a World of Turmoil, a, an eroded challenge for the OIC. This was highly received by the diplomatic community of the OIC and the member states. Also in our program, which is called the BINA program, which is an international development program for Libya to help it accelerate state rebuilding. And in collaboration with CETA, we also published a study for the policy and decision makers in Libya on countering violent extremism in Libya, a, a peace building uh, approach. Now, throughout all of our efforts in the OIC, we have this principle that we are which is based on that we are against extremism in all its forms, its manifestation, committed by whoever and uh, wherever. We are against of attributing violent extremism and radicalism to a specific country, race, religion, or nationality. We also believe that violent extremism cannot be countered by security and military means alone. We believe that extremism grows with the context of economic, social, and political environment. This is why it is very important to uh, consider historical injustices, occupation, deprivation, exclusion, discrimination, and mar marginalization. Also, the OIC emphasizes the need to counter the radical and extremist narratives and discourse. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we understand that cyber platforms are increasingly being used by violent extremist groups to spread hate messages and disseminate distorted and self-coined interpretation of the Holy Quran and Hadith, exploit socio-economic frustration of the Muslim youth, recruit and retrain and spread uh, hateful propaganda. For this reason, the Council of Foreign Ministers of the OIC has called for the in position of strengthening measures against social media sites being misused for these purposes. Uh, but nonetheless, we at the OIC, we are fully aware that legally and technically, it is not always possible to censor all such activities on the internet. The only remedy is to actively counter these uh, violent and radical narratives, to use the same online communication and social media tools, in order to uh, penetrate and use the soft power to leverage and engage the minds of these uh, people, uh, and this is the most effective tool. The other uh, challenge uh, that we face at the OIC is hate speech, or what we call Islamophobia. Uh, it seems that this is a problem that is not going to disappear anytime soon. On the contrary, that the analysis that we have done, it shows that it is uh, spreading more and more. In the last two years, according to our analysis, the number of uh, Islamophobia incidents has increased by uh, one third. Uh, to counter Islamophobia and hate speech, the OIC has, and it's different institutions, we have put a lot of efforts throughout the years uh, through organizing forums, uh, holding awareness activities, collaboration with international uh, and regional uh, institutions. Uh, but one of the most not notable efforts has been uh, establishing a, a dedicated uh, unit at the General Secretariat of the OIC, which is the OIC Islamophobia Observatory, to monitor is, uh, Islamophobia trends, to provide uh, analysis and periodic reports to member states, uh, also uh, taking a necessary measure to address this phenomena in coordination with our member countries, with the international communities, using the United Nations human rights mechanisms, as well other international and regional entities. More recently, the 12th session of the Islamic Conference of Information Ministers, which just ha had happened almost one, uh, one month ago here in Istanbul, under the theme of combating disinformation and Islamophobia in the post-truth era. At this high level ministerial conference of the OIC, 
the ministers elaborated important resolutions and they came up with important resolutions on combating disinformation and Islamophobia in the post-truth area. Uh, in addition, they adopted the Islamic, the Istanbul Declaration that stresses the need to combat Islamophobia and hate speech in all its manifestations by presenting the true image of Islam and utilizing new and emerging platforms uh, in this area. Uh, one last initiative I would like to touch upon within the OIC which is the Sawt al-Hikmah, which is the Voice of Wisdom. This is a center that uh, was established by the OIC in 2016 in order to utilize media and social networking platforms in order to uh, tackle the issue uh, of violent extremism and uh, hate speech. Uh, before concluding, uh, I would like uh, here uh, to express our deep admiration for the Republic of Turkey under the visionary leader of the, His Excellency President Recep Tayyip Erdogan for establishing a new approach into politics and diplomacy, uh, an approach that is rooted in morality, justice, and human values. Uh, with this new approach, we are witnessing Turkey is uh, spree, uh, spearheading the challenge to the unjust uh, international order. Not only that, Turkey has become a leader in promoting harmony and enhancing greater understanding among uh, diverse world civilization and has been proactive in trying to diffuse mutual suspicions, fear and tension. As Jonathan uh, rightfully mentioned, the, uh, Turkey is a founder partner of the United Nations Alliance of Civilization. Also, Turkey as a member of the OIC has put a lot of efforts to combat extremism and hate speech by uh, hosting various international summits and meetings and uh, helping the organization of Islamic cooperation in the OIC and in institution is this uh, important domain. With all those efforts, uh, the new Turkey under the leadership of President Recep Tayyip Erdogan really gives the people of this region and the whole world a glimmer of hope and a promise of salvation. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, I, I have been uh, publishing an annual report on Islamophobia since seven years now, and I'm, I'm the co-editor of this report called European Islamophobia Report, and uh, which can be also downloaded uh, from, uh, from its website, free of charge. And the Merciha is also one of the contributors to that, that report, uh, uh, authoring the, the North Macedonia, Macedonia report, uh, I think, uh, for a long time now. Uh, and uh, she has been also active uh, on the field as a representative of NGO. So she has also its, her own experience. After having two representatives of international organizations, we will hear about uh, an, an NGO activist and uh, her uh, experience in the field. So uh, what is your experience in this field? How Islamophobia um, is, uh, is affecting the daily life of peoples? And also the states are also state policies are affected also by Islamophobia, unfortunately, in, in some countries. The, the, this all narrative, uh, the negative narrative on Muslims. And um, we would like to hear your uh, own experience. And the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Enes, for a nice introduction. And I'm very happy that, uh, yeah, very happy to be here. Uh, and I hope I will hold your attention. And this summit was a really uh, interesting topic to uh, follow and how the panel was managing. It was yesterday we start with, uh, yesterday we start with uh, disinformation. And today we are uh, speaking about the, the panel before us, we were speaking in reality how it goes. So I'm, I'm a human rights activist, also I'm a lawyer. Uh, coming from the Balkan countries, who are always a uh, nice topic for any hatred to start it. And when we mentioned that the uh, hate speech never ending with just the speech or um, that information never finish uh, there, it also goes with the uh, hate crime. It then goes with the, uh, it, it ends with the genocide, with what we witness, uh, what we witness in uh, in the Balkans, so in my life I have uh, witnessed uh, several genocides, also the Republic of Kosovo was facing, and it's our neighborhood country, and the Bosnia. So definitely, I, it's not that I only research the uh, hate speech and uh, hatred and disinformation, we also see it on the ground, so we just give us more um, essential uh, view. 
So the, the reason how the hate speech started and it's happening and evaluating, uh, especially on the fragile countries uh, like the Balkan country is the, just the reason that they want to make people uh, unsafe, they want to make that isolated, powerless. And the professor before us was speaking about very nice word, uh, is dehumanization, so she explained it uh, even in Turkish language. What does it mean? So what are the reasons why the media, the politicians and individuals uh, especially extremist right wing party are using the uh, word of hatred is that that's because they want to dehumanize the person, the individuals, the group that they are speaking about. Because uh, is the fake news, the, is the hate speech, but the other side are the human rights. For me as a lawyer, the most difficult part of uh, be, uh, trying to protect human rights was uh, neglecting or not having so much solidarity, not having so much network of support of the people because uh, the discrimination started with the hate speech. So the people who will support you, who will help you to defeat this hate speech narrative or the discrimination now being frightened because the dehumanization process begins in the same time. So the, the empathy doesn't exist. So the empathy is uh, it's changed it's a change with the uh, securization, threat, uh, terrorism. So especially when we speak about the refugee rights and you know Macedonia was the part of so-called Balkan route, even the numbers of the refugees and migrants who crossed our country was huge, but the one who uh, stayed was the a very few number, but it was very good. Uh, it's a very good example how the uh, this propaganda started. Uh, yesterday the spokesperson from our government was uh, here and he had his own panel and he mentioned that in 2017 it uh, was very interesting uh, moment. Uh, the opposition, the, we had a local election so you expect a person, uh, the leaders to deal with the garbage, the sidewalks, the streets. But somehow the refugee or migration uh, movement start to be a topic. So it didn't stop only with the hate speech. It didn't start when only with the disinformation. It took a step further. It took with the movement. They organized so-called referendum against invading of the refugees and migrants. So it began with the hatred and become with the actions that um, they wanted to collect uh, signatures from the people. So that is also, when I mentioned the word of a referendum, we are also witnessing in the European countries a referendum for different issues regarding the Muslims, regarding the refugees. So we are spending uh, money of the taxpayers, uh, we are spending money of the budget of our countries to organize referendum against uh, burkas, to organize referendum against the migrants. So only because we needed this agenda on our platforms to spread hatred and fear among the uh, among the people so that we will gain votes. Because in reality we have we face many problems, many challenges but it's always better to switch another subject. So it doesn't finish when the politicians uh, organized, the, they didn't manage to organize the referendum because they didn't collect enough uh, signatures, but what was what uh, did happen? The party next, or opposition, even they, they are part of the left side, they're social democrats, they put the agenda of refugees among migrants so further away from their topics because it was not a nice topic to speak about it because in 2017 they were used to spread. So refugees and migrants, they were already dehumanized in our society, which led to lack of policy, which led to lack of protection. It led to uh, uh, using their basic human rights. Every person has a right to seek protection. Every human right has a need to ask for asylum. So we have a lack of system of protection now in the Balkan country and worldwide. We are lacking of protection because we uh, decided to fear to be the one who will uh, lead our policies. So it doesn't finish only with that. So the, uh, fortunately, the increase of the refugee flows to each country uh, fuel the state of hatred. We see so much hatred uh, everywhere. We see hatred on the social media and definitely something that uh, brings the policy of exclusion. 
We have in one side uh, the policy of uh, empowerment, empowering women to be more active, empowering Muslim women to be active in the field of education, in the field of uh, promoting the human rights. But when you reach the level that you want to promote and to be proud of your identity, you are reaching the uh, limit of uh, being not allowed to go further, being that you are not allowed to travel, you are not allowed to study, you are not allowed to work in specific places only because uh, the way how you look. So definitely we are living in the world of there is a systematic racism, systematic xenophobia, systematic Islamophobia. So imagine there is a person who will intersect in all this phobia. So if you are a migrant, uh, you are a, a woman or a man of color and you are a Muslim, so you will face many, many phobia in the hosting country where you expect to seek asylum. So definitely the, one of the biggest threats to the human rights are this, the hate speech, disinformation, which is uh, rapidly uh, seeing, we see there coming. Uh, coming. So definitely ra racist uh, rhetoric has been something that is overtaking the uh, European continent, is overtaking the, the, our activism. So in, our, in my activism on protecting or uh, advocating for uh, human rights, definitely I spend more time uh, defeating the hate speech not related to the promoting uh, human rights because the hate speech disinformation uh, see them as a threat and unfortunately we don't see the governments enough prepared we don't see the government supporting this movement or the hatred especially the uh, the institution who needs to protect like a ministry for interior public prosecutor office and now when we have the refugees coming from uh, it's a, a small number from uh, Ukraine coming to our Balkan country because they are visa free uh, we, don't, we see the system broken the system cannot protect them system cannot provide uh, the distant li distance life that they had because the policy of asylum was led by hatred and they were scared so they how decided so it doesn't finish only with the hate speech it doesn't finish only with discrimination in effect policy affect lives affects daily life of, of the individuals that's what we were facing during our activism thank you thank you very much uh, you have mentioned the Ukraine crisis. I think it was um, a huge uh, awakening moment for uh, for lots of people in the world. Uh, and the UN uh, Convention on Refugees, 1951 uh, Convention, uh, after the horrors of the Second World War, the international community came together and, and they created this convention in order to protect refugees because the wars can happen anywhere, anytime. And uh, but up until the Ukraine crisis, the we used to think that uh, conventional wars won't happen in, in continental Europe, but it does happen and it has created millions of refugees. And this uh, convention, uh, everybody can, will be, can, can need it in the future. You know, the wars can happen. Uh, and that's why I think it's important to, to protect this, uh, and, uh, this, uh, this convention and uh, that it is applied also in, in, in, in, in, in different countries, in all countries actually. So uh, we have still a little bit of time, and maybe we can have some questions from the audience, if there are any. So, uh, okay, I see one here. Uh, do, do we have a microphone for the questions? Uh, just right in the middle here. Do we have other questions from the audience? Okay, one there in the corner, one here, three actually. Okay, I can see. Herkese merhabalar. Ben sorumu Türkçe soracağım. Okay. Biraz müsaade eder misiniz? Or. Evet. Herkese merhabalar. Mülteci meselesinde biliyorsunuz. Geçmişte e, Saraybosna'da yaşanan olaylar oldu. Suriye meselesinde e, ve Irak'ta yaşanan o, savaşlardan dolayı mülteci sorunu ortaya çıkmıştı. Ve en son da e, Ukrayna e, savaşında, Ukrayna-Rus savaşında e, bir göç meselesi ortaya çıkmıştı. Bütün bu üç olayda e, bu mülte, e, kamuoyunun, dünya kamuoyunun özellikle Batı kamuoyunun
bu üç mülteci meselesine yaklaşımında İslamofobik bir yaklaşım e, olduğunu düşünüyor musunuz? Ne dersiniz? Teşekkürler. Thank you very much. Uh, the second question here and then we will have the third there. Thank you for your... Uh, just uh, second. Uh, we will collect the three questions and then maybe oh. here. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Moderator, for giving me this opportunity and to the panelists uh, for giving us uh, valuable insights on the subject matter. My name is uh, Abdi Noor Adin. I am a media and communications uh, practitioner and uh, mine is uh, a combination of a question and a comment as part of uh, some of the insights you've given in addressing this uh, pertinent topic on hate speech. Uh, we know Qatar has been hosting the 2022 FIFA World Cup and uh, we've seen there are a lot of uh, hateful remarks in as much as uh, it appears a kind of uh, criticism. But on the other end, um, we've seen the Turkish uh, observation or the Turkish view, which was initially uh, a comment from His Excellency President Recep Tayyip Erdogan that the world is bigger than five. So um, the views of the rest of the world as far as respecting the cultures and the norms of the people, as far as you know, looking at the, at the main issue instead of uh, the side matters, has actually uh, dominated you know, in countering the hate remarks. So for sustainability as a solution, I would like to, uh, to get your view. Um, as the involved experts in this uh, area who've given us uh, your comments on the issue. Do you think that in countering this hateful narrative, um, it's also important to have an alternative view that has global support and also coming together to give the people as a solution, uh, taking Turkish input as an example, as far as many issues that contribute to the promotion of hate are concerned? such as conflicts, humanitarian relief, and uh, many other uh, political related matters. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. And we have a third question here, right there in the back. So you card the Kushede. First of all, I would like to thank all the, the panelists for their precious insights on the topic on behalf of the Directorate of Communications. I work at the Directorate of Communications Legal Counselor's Office as an assistant expert on communications. Um, I'm also a law graduate. Uh, my question will be directed towards Mr. Uh, Flower. Flower. Uh, Jonathan. Oh, so Jonathan. Yes, yes, exactly. I'm so sorry. I'm a little excited. <laughs> um, so you were the first uh, participant here that has talked about the freedom of speech when it comes to uh, take countermeasures against hate speech or disinformation. And you've taken it a step further by saying that there is a border that uh, shouldn't be crossed. If it's been crossed, we're going to take some countermeasures to it, but there is no censorships. I would, love to, I would like to thank you for that. And my question is that, should that border be static or dynamic? W will it be changing through time? Or will we gonna just set some rules, grand rules for s some certain words, some certain topics, and they will be no-go zones and they will be free? Or will it just change systematically over time by uh, somehow measuring the people's minorities, communities, some belief groups, ethnic groups, reactions to those topics or to those uh, terms used by other people who are generating hate speech or black propaganda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see there are no other questions. And uh, maybe we start with the speaking order with Jonathan, and then uh, we continue with others. OK. Um, so thank you, thank, thank you for the question. As that one was directed to me, I'll, I'll, I'll take the liberty of responding to that one specifically. Um, I'm not an international lawyer, I hasten to add, but what I do know and what I can tell you, there is actually no international legal definition of hate speech. Um, so the characterization of what is um, hateful uh, is it's pretty controversial and it can be disputed because it varies from, from country to country, society to society. Um, 
So in the context of what we're doing um, as the United Nations, um, we understand, and I, I forgive me for quoting how we put it, um, hate speech is understood as any kind of communication in speech, writing, or behavior that attacks or uses pejorative or discriminatory language with reference to a person or a group on the basis of who they are, in other words, based on their religion, ethnicity, nationality, race, color, descent, gender, or other identity factor. Um, now, the point, of course, is that this is often rooted in, and it generates intolerance, um, hatred, and in certain contexts can be demeaning and divisive. But to, to look at specifically what international law says, and I alluded to this um, in, in, in my presentation, um, international law doesn't prohibit the hate speech as such, um, it prohibits incitement to discrimination, hostility, and violence. Um, now, that really comes from two, I suppose, yeah, two, two main sources, uh, the international legal frameworks for this. You've got the, com the, co the um, Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Um, forgive me, I've forgotten when that came into force. Um, and we have the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which came into force in 1976, but has been adopted progressively by countries um, before and since. Um, the reason I'm, I'm setting that out is that the, the way boundaries are created into international law, um, yes, I mean, it's possible that a, a boundary can be dynamic, but international law is, is a slow consensus um, crafting process, as it were. So if there is a perception that um, definitions need to, need to be changed, that has to be the, the subject to an international negotiating process to, to, to, to recraft elements of international law. I mean, it can be done through optional protocols, for example, these kind of things. But I, I take your point completely, because we are, we're living in a world which is incredibly fast moving, um, and what's considered right or wrong, um, and what's happening, um, is just accelerating the pace, pace of this kind of stuff. Um, but I would say, um, I mean, it's, it's difficult to create a dynamic border in, in the sense of the, the fastest possible, you know, moving, sort of adapting, because I think an element of um, consensus implies that there has to be an element of stasis, so the border has to be kind of static. But it can be adapted, it's just it has to be subject to, to a procedure. Um, I did want to just take the liberty of mentioning the fact that we are um, working in some ways to, to set sort of voluntary um, I don't want to say rules, but you know, a voluntary code of conduct. That's something that the Secretary General um, feels very strongly about. And um, in 2021, as, as um, in, in the wake of the 75th anniversary um, of the United Nations, the stuff that was going on the previous year, um, we set out, set out this thing called the Common Agenda. This was adopted by all the member states. And an aspect of that is a code of conduct um, that creates a digital public square that's inclusive and safe for all. So elements of consensus building about what inclusive and safe actually means will come into the discussions on that. That's something that's ongoing at the moment. Um, on the other questions, perhaps I'll leave those to my colleagues to respond. Maybe we continue with Fadi. You want to comment on the questions? The football. <laughs> first. All right. Yeah, then. No. The football first. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, I think um, I'll answer one of uh, the second question by the gentleman in the first row. Um, I believe that Islam, it is part, it's in the DNA of Islam, uh, this diversity of views and approaches and even uh, interpretations. Uh, this is why when we look at the history of Islam and the great cities that was built by uh, this religion, whether it's in Andalus, in Istanbul, in Baghdad, or in India, we see that it is a melting pot of people from different ethnicities, religions, views, and traditions. Uh, and it was not based on the principle of tolerance. No, it is beyond that. It was based on acceptance. Uh, and and that, that is beautiful. Uh, what we believe is that some people in the West and I say some, they have this view that their values are universal, and this is not the case. Uh, there are other views and are, there are other value systems in the world that uh, do exist and that uh, are valid. So uh, 
Uh, although I see, uh, I think this is something what we're trying to do, whether it's through Salt al Hikmah, which I just talked about, or through engaging different actors at the societal level or at the uh, multi uh, international level, is to first uh, raise awareness uh, and then engage uh, people. I think we should not uh, uh, just react. I think we continue need to build bridges to communicate freely and confidently and to really emphasize that uh, what some people in the West think that those values are universal, they are not universal. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Uh, regarding the question of uh, refugee, first of all, I have to say that I emphasize with uh, any refugee in the world, especially now the last one, the refugees from Ukraine, and I wish that peace will come and they will return back home to their uh, safe houses and the families. Most of them left their families behind them. They couldn't all be uh, evacuated or the, leave the country how the stages goes. So definitely we see how European Union had a, a very fast response of uh, the, uh, accepting the refugees from uh, Ukraine. They are all settled. Uh, they are all given the work. Most of them were given the working permit, educational. Even the university had a special additional funds given if they accept professors or um, researchers from uh, their university, which show us that we, uh, from 2014, we are calling to the EU leaders that they can do more for the refugee crisis. They can do more when we refer to refugee. And now with refugees from Ukraine, they show us they had a solution, but there was no will to do it. So we can sell, tell it, is it because of the racism? Is it uh, Islamophobia? Is it fear? Is it the fake news, disinformation? We can just uh, imagine, but uh, the refugees from, it's not the fault of the refugee of Ukraine that they couldn't find solution for them before. Even in my country, we also, Macedonia is part of that, we evacuated a thousand um, uh, evacuee from Afghanistan. They came with the planes directly to the air borders. In the same time, when the Afghanis have to enter in our country through very hard way, the migration route, how it goes. So there is a solution if there is a will and there is a convention that are regulated, there is a law. But unfortunately, refugees from Ukraine, like I mentioned in my speech, are facing with the asylum system who are fragile, who doesn't give them support. So now the Macedonian government has to improve the system because before there was no will, because the refugee was you have to pick it up, who, who do you want to stay in your country? But now this refugee coming from Ukraine, they are facing definitely challenges, not having working permit, education, vaccines, and any basic human rights has been uh, uh, not being given uh, to them. So I hope that the world will show solidarity like they show in the war in Bosnia with the refugees not stopping the war. It lasted for four years. But the war in Kosovo, which also they show uh, big responsibility uh, accepting refugees from Kosovo. But I really hope that the war in Ukraine will finish and the victim, there will be no so, so much victims and not more refugees in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marisiha. Um, well, uh, on that note, I would like to thank all of our speakers, uh, Jonathan, Fadi, and uh, Marisiha for this uh, insightful, for their insightful comments and participation. And uh, thank you very much also for your uh, uh, patience. And we will, I think, have another speech, uh, but thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Fantastic, thank you so much, really. What a great way to uh, conclude our final panel. Um, and now, last but not least, uh, I will introduce our final speaker, who hopefully uh, is ready to join us. We're slightly ahead of schedule, which is actually nice uh, for Saturday night traffic. <laughs> Everybody has to get back. Uh, so yes, this is our sixth and final Stratcom talk, social network map uh, of Turkey. I do hope our speaker is here. I'm having trouble seeing two